Hello, welcome. I'm Angela Gardner with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. Thank you for joining us at this webinar on how to start a food business uh, making cottage food products. To start us out, we have a poll to gauge our audience today. If you could, please uh, select one of the options, farmer, farmer's market manager, extension employee, uh, are you a small food business owner or producer, a caterer, or are you just interested in learning more about cottage foods? We have about 40 people joining us today, so this will help us uh, understand our audience. And also this uh, meeting is being recorded and will be posted to our webpage at www.uaex.edu backslash local foods. All right, Mary, um, what are the results for the poll? Can we just see who all's here? It looks like the majority of participants are just interested in learning more. So this is a great opportunity. We have uh, some great speakers lined up today. Uh, we have uh, three presentations, uh, one from uh, a representative with the Arkansas Department of Health and two additional presentations from myself and my colleague, Dr. Brian Matter with the Family and Consumer Sciences Department. We will then follow that with a question and answer session. And then we will have a panel with, featuring three cottage food producers. So during the presentations, if you have any questions, please uh, select the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in any questions that you have regarding the presentations. So to start out, we will have uh, Mr. Jeff Jackson and he'll present an overview of cottage food law. Take it away, Jeff. Thank you, Angela. It's good to be here with everyone today. Uh, and usually I would say I, I recognize some people in the audience, but I don't actually see that today. So uh, while I'm getting my presentation pulled up, we'll just get right into it. We're gonna talk today about uh, some of the laws uh, regarding cottage food in Arkansas and a brief history of those laws. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the foods that you can make. Hey, Jeff, we don't yes, see your presentation. Okay. We see oh. the desktop. Let me stop share and we'll go back to the right screen. Here, can you see it now? Yes, uh, it's not on the title slide, but we do see a presentation. Okay, that is the second slide. So we will go back or we will just start here. Perfect. Um, cottage food law brief history uh, in 2011 is when we got the cottage food law. Uh, and so it, it was the um, original modification where it changed the definition of what requires a permit in Arkansas. So it allowed the sale of bakery products, jams and jellies, candy, fruit butter, uh, and those items that are produced in a person's home that are sold directly to the consumer. Uh, and, they, and it defined what locations they could sell those at, which was a farmer's market, a county fair, or a special event, as well as the person's home. Uh, then in 2017, we added uh, chocolate covered fruits and berries that have not been cut or poked with a stick. Uh, and we also clarified that farmers markets can be physical and online. And then in 2019, uh, this past legislative session, we added uh, that sales at an unaffiliated business uh, provided that the producer is present at the point of sale. And we'll talk more in depth about what that means uh, here in just a few minutes. So the definition today is that cottage food production operations are food items that are produced in a person's home that are non-potentially hazardous food, such as bakery products, candy, fruit butters, jams, jellies, and chocolate covered fruit and berries that are not cut. Only these products are covered in the law and they are the only products that are allowed to be sold currently without a permit from the Department of Health. So just to kind of summarize, cottage food by statute does not meet the definition of, of a retail food establishment and does not require a permit. However, all food items are covered under the Arkansas Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And so they are required to be safe, unadulterated, and not misbranded uh, under that act. So a little bit about jams, jellies, and fruit butters. Uh, those, 
the assumption is, is that those products are made with sugar. If you use Splenda or other sugar substitutes, the food safety uh, of those products can't be ensured like it can if you use sugar. So we have to uh, make sure that we're not using uh, Splenda or sugar substitutes in our cottage foods. Where can we sell it? Again, we can sell from the site where the food is made uh, at a physical or an online farmer's market. We can sell at a county fair or at a special event such as uh, toad suck days uh, or at a pop-up shop. And then I also have a note here that internet sales of cottage food that are not associated with online farmers markets are not allowed. That doesn't mean that you can advertise the sale on online. It just means that the actual sale itself has to be a transaction between you and that consumer directly. Uh, what is a pop-up shop? So basically what a lot of farmers or uh, cottage food operators wanted to do was they wanted to be able to sell their products inside of another business uh, on a temporary basis. Uh, you know, so if, for example, they wanted to be able to set up at a coffee shop one day and sell their cinnamon rolls at that coffee shop. So uh, this act allows that to happen uh, as long as it's uh, the established business is not affiliated with the cottage food operator, meaning they can't also own that business. It has to be for a limited time period and have consent of the owner and the owner uh, or the employee, there has to be an owner or the employee of the cottage food operation uh, present at the point of sale. So it's still a direct sale of that cottage food product. Uh, and it also prohibits uh, the sale of uh, cottage food as a wholesale point of distribution. So it also has to be labeled. This is also in accordance with the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. It has to have a label on it and it needs to be clearly marked with the name and address of the person who made it, the name of the product, the ingredients in that product, and a statement using a minimum of 10 point type that says that this product is home produced. And I believe Dr. Mader is going to talk a little bit more about labeling here in just a few minutes. So there are some limitations in the act. So again, if the food item is not a bakery product, a candy, a fruit butter, jam, jelly, or a chocolate covered fruit and berry that is not cut or punctured, then it cannot be sold as a cottage food item. So specifically uh, for fruit butters, jams, and jellies, the, the federal government has regulations uh, that define standards of identity for jams, jellies, and fruit butters. And so the fruits that you're using to make those jams and jellies need to be identified in that CFR, and that can be found in 21 CFR 150. If you just Google search 21 CFR 150, you should be able to pull it up no problem. So what can we sell? We can sell cottage foods. And then in addition to cottage foods, we can also sell farm fresh eggs, livestock and poultry uh, does have some regulations on standards for those. So you need to check with them uh, to make sure that you're following those standards. You can also sell frozen USDA inspected meats, maple syrups, sorghum, whole uncut, uncut fruits and vegetables, and commercially processed non-TCS food. And there is a limitation as to how much uh, space you can have uh, available for, for commercially processed foods. And then foods that cannot be sold, uh, again, fruit, jams, jellies, and fruit butters, where there's not a standard of identity cannot be sold. And some examples of those are jalapeno jelly, banana nut jelly, bacon jam, and rosehip jelly. Uh, these foods don't have a low enough pH on their own to keep bacteria from growing in that product. So acid, usually it's, it's uh, vinegar or lemon juice has to be added uh, to drop the pH of that product. And because that's such a critical step, uh, it's important to food safety that that, that, that process is understood. Uh, so we consider these products to be low acid or acidified foods and they are not uh, jams or jellies and a permit is required uh, to make those products. The type of permit that you'll need for that is uh, typically a retail permit with a variance or you can get a manufactured food permit uh, and, and do it that way. The advantages of those we'll talk about a little bit later uh, in the Q&A, I believe. So other things that can't be sold at the farmer's market, we can't sell custard pies uh, because they require refrigeration. 
uh, dried fruits and vegetables or herbs and spices. We can't sell dried meats, salsas, juices, meringue pies, or milled grain and flour or cornmeal. Uh, also temperature controlled for safety food. So if you have to refrigerate it, you can't sell it at the farmer's market. Home canned foods, cheesecakes, cream cheese based frostings or fillings, cream pies and cream filled items or cured meats. And then we get into also uh, specialized processed things such as pickled uh, vegetables or fermented foods. Uh, that's a picture of kefir there if you're not familiar with what kefir is. Uh, salads, uh, shelled peas or nuts, sliced fruits or vegetables, smoked meats, and sprouted beans and seeds. And then also finally we cannot sell homemade cheeses, raw milk, or wild harvested mushrooms. Uh, even if we have a permit we can't sell those. So a little bit on sampling. Uh, we cannot prepare samples on site without a retail food establishment permit. So, but we do allow for cottage foods to be provided as samples if they are prepackaged, they're labeled appropriately, and they, and due to COVID-19, we also ask that they be uh, handled or provided to the consumer in such fashion as to prevent uh, contact with multiple samples. So they need to be uh, spread out on the table where someone can easily grab them or the uh, producer will hand them to them individually. And with that, I'm gonna pause here for just a second to let you write down my contact information so that if any questions today aren't answered, uh, you can feel free to give me a call and I'll discuss them with you. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back over to Angela for the second half of the presentation. Thank you, Jeff. That was a lot of great information on cottage food law. And for my talk, I just wanted to share with you all some commonly asked questions we receive at Extension regarding what is and not allowed under cottage food law. So let's apply a little bit of what we just learned from Jeff's talk to see if you can answer these following questions. So uh, these two questions here we get from small food businesses. <clears throat> the first one, can my product be sold in stores? Meaning that can they be sold on the grocery store shelf and I do not have to be present? The second one is, can I sell pickles, salsas, sauces at the market? I'm assuming that's the farmer's market. So think through those so answers. So can my can my cottage food product be sold in stores? And this is not allowed under cottage food. You need to be present at the point of sale if you are selling cottage food items. Now, if you want to get your food item onto a grocery store shelf, you would then need to um, <clears throat> get a permit from the Arkansas Department of Health. It's called a Manufactured Wholesale Foods Permit. You would need to follow good manufacturing practices such as uh, health and hygiene and cleaning and sanitation of uh, facilities and equipment. And the biggest piece here is that you have to use a certified commercial kitchen, certified by the Arkansas Department of Health for that activity. Okay, second question, can I sell pickles, salsas, sauces at the market? So it's the same as the answer above, it's not allowed for cottage food. So pickles, sauces, sauces are not considered cottage food products. So what that means is if you want to sell pickles, sauces, and sauces, you would need to apply for a manufactured wholesale foods permit. You would also need to follow good manufacturing practices as you're making that product and use a certified commercial kitchen. Plus, if you are making pickles, um, you would also need a process authority letter from our state food safety scientist. And what that, um, what that professional does is, is they verify the recipe that you're using to ensure that it reaches the food safety standards, that you're using the correct amount of vinegar or acid to ensure that um, microbial bacteria do not grow on your pickles. Okay, the second set of questions we receive from farmers. So a big one we always receive because there's not any clear definition of uh, raw fruits and vegetables under cottage food is, can I sell bagged lettuce at the farmer's market? 
The second one is, can I sell pickles, salsas, sauces at my farm stand? And the third, can I sell creamed honey at the farmer's market? So with the first one, um, yes, you are allowed to sell bagged lettuce. So say you're putting different uh, lettuce greens to make a salad mix in a bag. The, the, the biggest you know, point to, to know here is you can only cut that piece of lettuce once from harvest to bag. So say you have like a six inch leaf of romaine and you want to tear that up into smaller pieces to make it look nicer in your bag. That is not allowed uh, under cottage food because what you're doing is you are processing that lettuce. And in order to, to do that, you would have to go through the process of getting a manufactured permit by the Department of Health and use a facility that's a certified commercial kitchen facility. This is just to make sure that when we are cutting the lettuce that we're doing it in a safe manner in a certified clean sanitary facility. The second question, can I sell pickles, salsas, sauces at my farm stand? Yes and no. It depends on the pickle, salsa, sauce that you're trying to sell. So whoever, whether it's you as the farmer, if you made the pickle, salsa, sauces, is it certified? Do you have a permit from the Department of Health? Did you make that product in a certified commercial kitchen facility? If so, then yes, you can sell it. If not, that's that's not a cottage food item, you can't sell it at your farm stand. If you're purchasing this from another supplier, if you're purchasing this from your farmer friend down the road, you need to check to make sure that they have gotten their permit to make that product as well. And then finally, can I sell creamed honey at the market? Yes, you are allowed to sell creamed honey as a cottage food item at the market. Uh, creamed honey is just pure honey that's been aerated. It's just changed its physical appearance. Now, if you start adding additional items to that creamed honey, such as nuts or spices or seasonings, that is not allowed because you're adding something to that product and it's not pure honey. So if you do want to make creamed honey with other items in it, flavored honeys, infused honeys, those activities would need to be conducted in a commercial kitchen and you would need to get a permit from the Department of Health to do that. So if you need additional assistance, um, our, de our department at Extension offers assistance to farmers regarding produce safety and we have some grower trainings that are upcoming in November and December. If you have never heard of the produce safety rule and would like to learn more about food safety on the farm, uh, please visit our website. And then for food producers, we provide technical assistance for um, understanding the food safety regulations and food science uh, technical assistance for your product. In our website, you can find information on cottage foods, manufactured foods, and how to start a food business. We also have started three uh, certified commercial kitchens in rural areas across the state. So we have small shared use kitchens in McCrory, Marshall, and Ryzen, Arkansas. And we are open to clients who are wanting to create uh, food products for the market. My contact information is there and I'll add these to the chat as well so you can have that information. So that is the end of my presentation and I will pass it on to Dr. Brian Matter. Thanks, Angela. Um, I'm going to talk quickly today about some um, cottage food, food safety basics. And I'll encourage everyone to go ahead and put uh, your questions in the Q&A. We have a few coming in so far, but any questions you can think of, uh, feel free to put those in the Q&A and we'll get those answered. So back to some food safety uh, considerations for cottage foods. We're gonna talk just briefly about uh, personal hygiene, um, permitted foods, time and temperature foods, and then also cleaning and sanitizing. So first, um, probably one of the most important and key factors for uh, cottage food safety is hand hygiene. Uh, we should all be professionals by now with uh, the um, COVID-19 public health emergency. We should all be professionals at hand washing, but it's always a good reminder to remember uh, sort of the basic steps for hand washing. 
Those are found over here on the left. Uh, wet your hands, lather with soap, scrub your hands with soap, rinse them, and dry them. Um, more importantly, probably, is, is when to think about washing your hands and when you should do that while you're preparing your cottage foods. So you need to think about washing your hands when you do things like entering your kitchen, changing tasks, so whether that's changing the ingredients that you're working with, before and after you are handling any of your food products, um, before and after you're cleaning and sanitizing your work area or your equipment that you're using to create the cottage foods, um, after touching garbage cans, after coughing and sneezing, and then before and after using gloves. Um, so the, the key takeaway here is that this simple practice of hand washing helps to dramatically reduce the risk of foodborne illness uh, when you're creating your cottage foods. So um, when should you wear gloves while you're handling cottage foods? Anytime you're, re you're handling uh, ready to eat foods, so those are things like cooked foods, so that may be loaves of bread that have just come out of the oven. Uh, after you've washed fruits and vegetables, uncut fruits and vegetables, uh, any other bakery items or spices and seasoning. Um, you don't necessarily need gloves for washing produce or for handling uh, ready to eat ingredients that are gonna go into a dish that will eventually be cooked to temperature. The other consideration is that you need to make sure that you're changing gloves if you're changing tasks. So if you're going from something like working with ingredients to cleaning an area, you would want to change gloves and then uh, wash hands after that. So Jeff did a really good job of running through this list, but I do think that it is uh, something that bears repeating. So. The allowable products list uh, is really based on the food safety risk level that's associated with these certain types of food. So generally any food that requires processing, so even cutting fruits and vegetables, uh, is gonna fall into the category that requires an ADH permitted kitchen. Um, and so the no permit required category over here on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, those are the exceptions to this rule. And bakery products such as breads, brownies, cookies, those things don't require a permit and neither do things like candies, fruit butters, honey, jams and jellies and whole and uncut fruits and vegetables. And notice the whole and uncut fruits and or whole and uncut uh, phrases here as this determines in part whether or not you need a permit. The food products that fall under the uh, no permit required category uh, are not foods that uh, require time and temperature control for safety. And so uh, these TCS foods, they would require cooking or holding at a specific temperature range in order to keep them safe and to prevent uh, bacteria and other causes of foodborne illness from beginning to grow. So this is especially true of acidified foods like salsa or other foods which require um, a certain pH level to maintain that safety zone. So speaking of uh, timer and temperature control, uh, this applies directly to time and temperature control for safety foods, but uh, it's always a good reminder to ensure that you're cooking foods to the proper internal temperatures, staying out of that danger zone, uh, which is above 40 degrees Fahrenheit or below 140 degrees Fahrenheit, and reducing the opportunity for pathogens to come into contact with uh, or begin growing on the food products that you're trying to uh, create. So finally, uh, talking a little bit about um, cleaning and sanitizing, we want to always make sure that our kitchen spaces, our workspaces, equipment is always, uh, is always cleaned and sanitized before and after coming into contact with food products. And um, you may or may not know, but there are two different definitions to cleaning and sanitizing. Cleaning, you can think of as removing sort of the surface dirt, the grime, the impurities off of maybe a countertop. Um, an example of maybe uh, wiping bits of uh, freshly chopped uh, vegetables or something like that into the, the trash. Uh, sanitizing, this, this is a separate process and typically requires and uses a chemical solution in order to kill germs on those work surfaces. And uh, typically this is done with a, a chemical sanitizing solution. So Jeff also mentioned the cottage food labeling requirements, but I uh, wanted to reiterate them and just make sure that uh, it was well understood what those requirements are 
So again, those are a clear label without nutritional claims. And as you can see over here on the right, this is just an example of a um, of, of cottage food label. So again, a clear label without any nutritional claims. It must have the name and address of the manufacturer, uh, the product name, all ingredients that are found in the, pro in the product that you're creating, the 10 point type phrase of this product is home produced, and then a list of potential allergens um, on the product as well. And here is my contact information. If I can be of any assistance to you, please feel free to contact me uh, either by phone or email and I will do my best to get uh, your questions answered. Okay, well, thanks for, for that, uh, for listening to our few presentations there. I hope that information was useful. We're actually now going to take uh, and answer some of your questions that came in. So the first question, uh, just a, a clarifying question. So can we sell online or we can't? And I think that's in reference to uh, maybe Jeff's presentation uh, talking about cottage food products being eligible for sale online. So Jeff, do you wanna give a, a clarification there? Sure, so you can, the sale itself cannot be cannot occur online. So for example, someone can't order uh, your product from you uh, and then you ship it to them uh, in New York City. Okay, so a couple things go on there. Whenever you, When food starts crossing state lines, it starts borderlining on whether or not it's FDA controlled or not. So uh, the internet itself uh, has no boundaries, right? So whenever the transaction goes through the, the internet, it can't, it could possibly be considered uh, a out of state transaction. We're not going to push that so far, but the law requires that it be a direct sale uh, transaction uh, where the person has the opportunity to, to meet the person who made it and, and see it. So you can take orders online as long as that sale and the actual transition uh, occurs in person. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, it looks like the next few questions are about uh, an interest in having these slides. Um, I, I will remind you this presentation is being recorded, but we may also be able to make the slides available uh, to you afterwards. Brian, okay. I have a question for you. Um, okay. If there's not any more in the Q&A box. Um, we do you have had... a couple. Okay. Um, but I'll, I'll come right back to yours after um, we answer this one. So the next question coming from the Q&A, it says, I make a candy, toffee, that is butter, sugar, water, and caro syrup, milk, chocolate, and pecans. Due to the pecans, it doesn't look like this could be sold as a cottage food. Uh, yes, toffee would be a candy and we would allow it to be sold under cottage food. Uh, the pecans would probably need to come from a, an approved source uh, versus harvesting those and shelling them yourself. Although the risk would be pretty low considering uh, the high sugar content of the toffee uh, may be a little bit inhibitory, but uh, out of an abundance of caution, I'd recommend to, to use uh, pre-manufactured pecans. Great, thank you, Jeff. Um, it looks like the other question we have up here is asking about a copy of the video. Yes, we will. This video is being recorded, and so we will have it available on our website shortly after today's presentations. And those are the only other questions I see on the Q&A. So, uh, Angela, did you have a question? Yeah, you, Brian, had mentioned uh, to not make nutritional claims on the label. Could you give an example of what a nutritional claim is that we shouldn't be putting on our labels? Sure, that's a great, uh, great point, great question. So the nutritional claim would be something like, um, something like increases your levels of vitamin C or increases, um, what's another good example? I'm trying to think. Uh, low fat would be yeah, another Yeah, low fat, thank you for, for chiming in there, Jeff. Um, 
Also, you wouldn't want to put anything on there that's going to say lowers your sodium level or lowers your cholesterol, anything like that. So we want to, to steer away from making any claims that it may, may or may not be supported by the, the product. Well, I currently do not see, oh, actually we just had one more question pop up. Um, what about making a nutritional claim that a product is gluten-free as a label? So I think that would probably fall under the making of a nutritional claim. So I would say that that's probably not going to be allowed for um, cottage food products. One other question. Um, I did not see spice mixes on the list. I make all of my own spices. So would spice mixes be allowed? Uh, spice mixes would not be allowed to be sold under cottage food because they, they wouldn't meet any of the, uh, the, the food types. They're not a bakery product. They're not a jam or a jelly or a fruit butter. Uh, so spice blends, because there's equipment involved and, and if you do the research, there's actually a significant number of outbreaks uh, each year tied to uh, different spices. Uh, pepper, there was a large uh, black pepper one a few years back. Uh, and then a few years, uh, just a couple years ago, there was a cilantro one. So um, we do require a permit for any spice mixes. Okay, great to know. Thanks, Jeff. Um, could you please define what a bakery product is? A bakery product would be a bread or a pie or a cake or brownies, uh, something uh, of that nature that is uh, typically uh, has sugar and flour in it, uh, typically. Uh, but, you know, some, some item, we get a lot of uh, strange questions uh, from time to time, but, you know, your typical items that would be found in a bakery, uh, those are the items that we're talking about. Okay, and another question. So for cottage foods, do I need a business license and do zoning laws affect me? That would be a question more directly for your local uh, city or county uh, to answer, but typically, yes. Uh, anyone who does, has a business in a city or county typically requires a business license, uh, but that may not be the case for your particular town. So I would contact uh, City Hall and the County Judge's Office and, and inquire with them specifically about what laws will apply to you. Okay, great. Well, I, do we have any more questions, Brian, popping up? Uh, we just got one that came up just now. And that question is, uh, does a buttercream frosting for cakes containing butter and sugar fall under a cottage food? Yes, it would. Butter would be considered a uh, temperature control for safety food. Uh, even though we don't see a lot of outbreaks associated with butter, uh, it still is technically a TCS food. So a uh, buttercream frosting that was prepared or that, that you purchase store-bought uh, and have, have documentation of that on your label, uh, you can use that, but you, we would not allow you to use one that you made at home. Well, I think that's our last question for the Q&A session. So we'll now move on to our panel section with being moderated by Dr. Matter. All right, thanks, Angela. So I'm excited to welcome today uh, three different panelists. We have with us, um, we have with us um, Monica Chatterton from Flake Baby Pastry and Val Taylor from Daisy Mays and also Andy Kuroki from Kuroki Bakery. And so I'm gonna ask the panelists a series of questions and um, hopefully uh, start some conversation and, and get some, some information from them about their experiences with cottage foods. And uh, I hope it's a, a, an insight to their experiences and, and what they've learned along the way. So um, I'll, I'll go ahead and let them introduce themselves and then we will jump right into the questions. So um, Monica, do you wanna introduce yourself first? Um, so yeah, I'm Monica Chatterton. I'm the owner and operator of uh, Flake Baby Pastry out of North Little Rock. Um, I sell in Little Rock as well, but uh, I specialize in homemade hand pies, um, aka Pop-Tarts, basically. Um, and I've, uh, 
I've been making and selling those since 2016 and slowly expanding. Uh, I currently sell at the Whitewater Tavern uh, Farmer's Market on Saturdays. Um, also through the uh, online uh, farmer's market, the ALFN market, um, and also take custom orders. Okay, great. Thanks, Monica. Andy? Hi, um, I'm Andy Kuroki. I'm the owner and operator of Kuroki Bakery, Artisan Breads and Pastries. Uh, I operate out of Russellville, Arkansas. Um, I specialize in artesian breads and French patissier. So uh, we sell at the Pope County Farmer's Market here in, Arca in Russellville, as well as uh, the Russellville Community Market, which is an online farmer's market. And I also take uh, specialty orders. Thanks, Andy. Val. Hi, my name is Valor Taylor Cobbins, and I'm the owner of Daisy May's Gourmet, and we're out of Jacksonville, Arkansas. Uh, we specialize in a gourmet candy and gourmet jams and jellies. So uh, we started selling at farmer's markets. Now we sell at the online farmer's market, and we do take uh, specialty orders. Okay, great. Well, thank you, thank you guys for uh, introducing yourselves, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing your, your answers to the questions. So, uh, Monica, I'll start off with you asking you this question. Um, can you describe for us your experience working with Cottage Foods and give us some, maybe some context of, of what you've done with Cottage Foods and, and the level of, of experience you have with Cottage Foods uh, in building your food business? Yeah, so I, um, I kind of accidentally happened upon it, I think. Um, I, I was uh, working, cooking slash baking at a local restaurant and uh, I, I made brunch there and I started um, making Pop-Tarts on the weekend and noticed that they sold out like really quickly and people seem to be really excited about them. And I can't remember exactly. It might've actually been Angela Gardner because we kind of worked together. Um, I somehow like learned that I was act like, I was actually able to sell them um, and bake them from my house. And so I, you know, I thought about it cause they were so popular at the restaurant that I was at and uh, kind of slowly got my foot in the door that way. Um, just starting out, you know, as a side hustle selling to friends and family um, and then eventually got a social media account for it. And um, last year I started uh, selling at the Bernie's Garden Farmer's Market and that was when it kind of took off. Um, and so through social media and networking there, um, it just kind of grew into something bigger. Um, and as of June this year, I'm, it's full time. So it's a, it's a full time job and it can be and I kind of never really thought about it that way until this year. I don't know why. <laughs> um, because it's a, it's a really awesome gig, so highly recommend. Great, that's good to hear. Andy, what about you? Uh, I was actually, just like Monica, I kind of stumbled upon it. Um, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. I went to culinary school there and worked as a professional pastry chef in fine dining restaurants and restaurants up there uh, doing work. And then when I got married, I moved down here to Arkansas and couldn't find a job. Couldn't find a job in my field um, with the skills that I had. I was making bread professionally before moving away. And um, the closest job I could find would be an hour drive in the morning. So I started looking into farmer's markets and found out about the Arkansas Cottages Law. I had no idea that such a thing existed before. So I started getting into that and looking into that and found out that the majority of what I make falls under uh, the cottages food law. So it was really easy for me to transition from working full time in a restaurant to working full time at home. And uh, it really worked great for me because I had a ton of equipment that I had nothing to do with <laughs> until that time. So it was really more easy for me to move from one to the other because it was a product that I had already been making for years. So to be able to do that on my own terms and to experiment and do things in my own way was a really great opportunity with the Cottages Food Law. Great, thank you for sharing. Uh, Val. So we were um, fairly new to Arkansas and we were in the process of trying to start a winery um, and we were raising bees. So we had a lot of time on our hands and a whole lot of fruit. Um, so I started making jams and jellies. 
Well, once we developed the wines, I wanted something sweet to go along with our sweetest wine, our dessert wines, but I didn't know how to bake. So I started making candies and developed this um, gourmet toffee. Well, that year over the holidays, we sent out so much jelly, candy, and honey to our friends and family and coworkers that everybody started asking how they could buy it. So I started looking into you know, ways to sell my product and I came across the cottage food laws. Um, so I uh, followed the law, uh, figured out how to label my products. And then I contacted uh, the River Market and asked if I could come and set up. So I uh, ventured out to my first farmer's market table and it's been going from there. Great, good to hear, good to hear. So uh, Monica, I'll start you off with the, our second question. So who was or what are resources that you used when you were starting your uh, cottage food business? Um, that's a good question because I feel like for a long time, I just kind of scrambled around and um, it was really hard for me to figure out what I was doing. <laughs> uh, so it's great that there's, uh, that this is happening and um, that, that you guys are providing resources because I feel like I I didn't know where to start aside from like the, um, the website on the, I guess it's the, uh, I think it's the U of A website, maybe, or maybe it's the university or I can remember. Um, but I slowly through, um, I started out by just talking to fellow bakers, like people who I met at the market to kind of figure out like, okay, like, how do we do this? Like for real? Cause I knew like the labeling and stuff like that. Um, the market manager at Bernie's uh, gardens last year coached me through all of that. Um, but I started by just talking to other cottage food people who I knew had been doing it for, for a little while, and uh, which was also a good way of networking, um, and then kind of ended up uh, like finding out about the Arkansas Small Business and Technology Development Center, um, which I admittedly not use as much as I should because it's a, it's a free resource. They give uh, free consulting, and it's all done virtually right now, especially, um, and so they're really awesome for any business, but like for cottage food, uh, particularly like any sort of free consulting is great. I've um, spoken with them about um, like liability insurance and, you know, different things like that, that I would need for my business. Um, and then ultimately, um, and as you mentioned earlier with the, um, uh, you know, needing to contact your local city hall for uh, different information about um, licensing and stuff like that, like that's, uh, I, thankfully like talked to someone super helpful at my city hall in uh I'm in North Little Rock and they were able to guide me where I needed to you know get my business license and the zoning um it was super easy to I did it all in one day like the license and um the zoning certificate I guess uh so yeah I would say just like a lot of it was talking to other bakers other cottage food um uh makers and you know people at the farmer's market was where I kind of figured out where to go from there. Okay great. Andy what about you? Um, just like Monica again uh, we seem to follow a similar path. Um, my husband actually is a professor at Arkansas Tech and they do have the Arkansas um, Business and Technology Development Center right there in their business department. So um, I was able to just walk on in there and ask them um, how I obviously I've never owned a business before. So I had to figure out what, how do I pay taxes? <laughs> what do you need to do to do that? Because you don't want to be non-compliant with that ever. Um, and then they, she ran down a list for me, what I need to do. Do I need a permit? Do I need licensing? is what I'm doing follow under any of those. So it was really great to have that checklist to go through because it can be incredibly overwhelming trying to figure out um, what you need to be compliant in your state. And it will differ. Like I don't need a zoning uh, permit here in Russellville, although Monica did. Um, I also spoke to people at the Pope County Farmers Market and asked them, oh, well, what do, what do you do? And they said, here's a resource. Go to the University of Arkansas. They um, have a list. They have a whole website dedicated to what cottages food is, what you can and cannot sell. So I started there and just did a lot of online research. And I actually used my grandmother 
Um, my grandmother worked for Riches Corporation, which uh, is kind of like Wilton, like cake decorating. And she traveled all over the United States to uh, decorate cakes and keep like, make sure that every uh, price chopper made their roses exactly the same. But she knew uh, a lot about cottages food and she was able to walk me through a lot of it as well. So, you know, you never know who can be of assistance to you, your colleagues, your friends, people at the market, or even your family. Great, thanks Andy. Uh, Val, what resources did you use? Um, I started with the Department of Agriculture. Um, I called and asked a ton of questions to the inspectors um, and I read the website, I printed it, I memorized everything about the cottage foods in Arkansas. Um, and then when I was traveling to all the different farmers markets around the city, I met a ton of food entrepreneurs who um, talked about their journeys um, I've taken classes with the Arkansas Small Business and Technology Development Center. Uh, they, they had a class uh, starting a food business. They also offered us starting a farmer's market business. So um, I was just a, a big student, I guess. Great, good points, yeah. Okay, uh, moving on to the third question, I'll uh, send it back over to Monica. So this is kind of a fun one. Uh, what's your favorite part about working with Cottage Foods? Um, yeah, this is my like biggest one because I kind of started thinking about it and thought of a lot of things. Um, but I'd say the the two biggest or like best parts of it for me are the freedom um, uh, that you get from, you know, having your own business, being your own boss, not having a staff <laughs> in my case. Um, it, it kind of all falls on you when you're starting out. Um, it can be kind of scary, but it's also really liberating because especially for me, I've um, I really enjoyed the, the aspect of like, you know, creating specials at the restaurants that I worked at and, and uh, testing out new things. And this way there's no filter there between, I mean, it's my own, uh, vision. So that's like, it's very liberating. Um, and then, uh, it's also like the, the ability to control your own schedule and like, um, especially coming from the food industry, it's hard sometimes to take off work when you, you know, when you want to, or you need to, and, uh, there's a pressure to, you know, work when you're sick even, and I don't have to, I'm unlearning that right now, which is good. Uh, you shouldn't work when you're sick. Um, and then a, the other big thing is the, the community kind of like sense of community that I get from, uh, from meeting my customers face to face and from going to the farmer's market and connecting with, uh, with farmers and buying produce from them. And um, because buying local has always, has been important to me in this way, like I have a, a relationship with the people who are growing the food that I'm using in my, you know, to make jelly for my pop tarts. Um, and so that's been really nice. And uh, similarly with, with pop-ups, like I've been doing pop-ups every month at uh, Fidel and Co, which is like my favorite coffee shop in, in Little Rock. And it's so nice. Like it originally they wanted to just uh, to wholesale, to buy, product from me um, to sell, you know, like while I wasn't there and because I wasn't able to do that, um, yeah, I suggested that we do a pop-up and it actually works out better because then I, I have to physically be there and I get to meet people that I might not normally meet that, you know, you know, people that don't necessarily go to the farmer's market, but they love coffee and they'll come in and, and I get to chat with my customers. So that's been, uh, I feel a lot more rooted in my community by doing that than, you know, just maybe working in, in the back in a kitchen somewhere. So uh, that's been probably my, my favorite part of it. Great, thanks. Uh, Andy, what about your favorite parts of Cottage Foods? The freedom, yeah. The freedom really, really does it. When you work in um, professional kitchens and you work as a professional, um, you don't you don't get to take time off. You always work Christmas, you always work Thanksgiving, <laughs> you work every weekend. Uh, you never get to take a weekend off. So um, being able to set your own schedule to uh, say, well, Mondays are my day. That's my day. And you, you can develop whatever you want. You can sit home if you want. Um, my person, I'm personally a mom. So I have two children. So having that freedom, being able to work from home and watch my children grow um, is really a huge benefit. When I had my first child, I had him alone. So I was in culinary school and going to work 
and taking care of a child. So I didn't get to spend time with my child. Um, he was about six before I finally got to start looking to stay home. And with my, not my youngest one now, he's been with me the whole time. So I get to watch him grow and he gets to watch me work, but we have our separate spaces, but being able to stop and say, what can I do to help my family is really um, a huge benefit. And I absolutely love that about working with Cottage Foods. Um, I also love meeting all of my customers. I go to the farmer's market every Saturday morning and I get to speak to the people. I get to know them personally, what they're looking for, what they need, um, especially with bread. Uh, people seem to have um, more concerns dietary wise and I'm able to meet those for certain people. I have a woman who used to live in France who can't eat bread here, but I make a special baguette just for her and she can eat bread again. She hasn't had bread for 17 years. So um, that's really important to me to be able to meet with those people and really connect with them and what they need. And like she said before, I feel more rooted in my community. I feel a vital part of it, um, being able to speak with people one-on-one. -on -one. Great, thanks Andy. And Val, what, what's, your, what's been your favorite part? Uh, definitely the ability to work from home. Um, but to be creative, uh, and you can, with cottage food laws, you can create things at a low cost. You can venture into new business without having to um, take such a large risk. Um, I love being able to get my family involved too, to pass this on to possibly, you know, my kids or my grandkids. So um, I just love having that ability. Uh, and then the, the people. I have met so many people. I was new to Arkansas. Uh, I'm still using GPS to get around. And, um, but through the farmer's markets, being face-to-face -face with customers and talking to them, understanding what it is they like and being able to be responsive to those things and delivering, um, it's, it's been a pleasure for me. Great, thank you. I think that was that was a, a great answer from all three of you. It's it's really neat to hear all of those experiences. Uh, so, final question for the three of you: um, What's one piece of practical advice that you would give someone who is just starting out on their either food entrepreneurial journey or their cottage foods journey? So, Monica. Um, so I have more than one, but I'll be fast because <laughs> there's a few things that uh that definitely stand out so number one is uh social media is definitely a necessary evil for a small business um and that's like that's kind of how i've gotten my footing um is is definitely like social media people all the time at the market like oh my god i follow you and i'm so excited to try it which can be scary because when there's like hype already built up but it, it's it's helped me uh grow my business for sure um and i would say uh, keep your receipts, <laughs> uh, learn about taxes early on because I was like, I, because it started off for me as a side hustle, I, I wasn't taking it seriously in that way until it became clear, like, okay, this is like getting big to the point where like, I need to, um, be keeping track of all of this. So like definitely keep your receipts, write things off for, um, you know, equipment and, uh, gas mileage and, uh, and the food costs, all of these things, um, buy in bulk, build relationships with, uh, with people, other like cottage food people and, and farmers. Um, and then beware of grain moths. I like, I mean, this is specific to somebody who bakes probably, but I had no idea that, uh, there are certain moths that love to eat your flour. Um, <laughs> despite having everything in like plastic containers and it's, it's, uh, yeah. So definitely be aware of that and wear dish gloves because you'll be doing a lot of dishes and you will be washing your hands constantly. And it is, especially now with the pandemic, like it is so hard on, on your skin. <laughs> so those are, those are my big, my big ones for sure. Thanks for sharing. Andy. Um, my practical advice would be to really think about where you're wanting to go with this. Um, is this something that you just want to do part-time? Is it just a weekend thing? Or are you really looking to make this um, a full-time business? Um, starting out, I knew that I wanted to do this um, 
eventually full time. This is a stepping stone for me right now. Like I said before, it works for me to be at home with my children, but it is a stepping stone for me to build rapport in my community and to build those um, connections so that eventually I will move up and make a brick and mortar. It is okay for it to be a hobby. It is okay for it to be just a weekend thing. Um, but I think it's really important for you to have in your mind what you are wanting to do with it because it can get out of hand <laughs> very quickly. Um, if you have a popular product, you can become so entrenched in that business that it does become a full-time business and you have to be prepared for that because it does take a physical toll, an emotional toll, and an intellectual toll. You are constantly working if you do run this as a business. If, like me, you do decide to run it as a full-time business, really think about branding. Um, I know that seems really silly, like things like Louis Vuitton or Starbucks or what have you, um, but what makes those businesses so popular, and if you want to be popular, especially in the cottage foods industry, you have to make a name for yourself, and branding is really important. Um, social media, like you said, is a necessary evil. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, being able to navigate those comfortably are really important too. So um, just the food aside, the business part of it um, can be very difficult and having a clear idea of what you're wanting for yourself will help you keep boundaries for yourself and the people around you. And I think that's really important to consider. Great, thanks Andy. Val, uh, what's your advice? Um, so I say start with one product. What's the best thing that you make? What's the best flavor cake? If you love strawberries, start there and make a great strawberry jam. It becomes easier to become an expert and then you get people to trust you and they'll look forward to your next product. Um, I would also say have fun. When you stop having fun, it's time to stop doing it. Okay, great. Yeah, that those are all three great pieces of advice. And I want to thank uh, all three of you for sharing your perspectives and your experiences with all of us today. Um, unfortunately, I, I know we could probably talk to the three of you for the whole rest of the day. We do have to wrap up the Q&A portion of our presentation today. So uh, again, thanks to the three panelists. Thank you very much for your uh, sharing your experiences, your advice. And hopefully the attendees out there can take that advice and, and uh, make their own way with, with Cottage Foods. So now I will turn it over to Angela to close us out. Thanks again to the panelists and all of our presenters today. Um, for our audience members, if you could please provide us feedback on this webinar. Uh, I posted a link to that survey on the chat. Um, so when you hop off of here, um, go to that link. I believe once we leave the webinar, you should be directed to that link as well. And we have tons of resources in the chat, lots of web addresses. So if you have any additional questions that we didn't get to today, please reach out to myself, Dr. Brian Matter, Jeff Jackson with the Department of Health, and our food panelists, Monica, Andy, and Valor. Thank you so much for your time today, and we will post this recording to our webpage at www.uaex.edu backslash local foods. Thank you so much.